Today's episode of Market Talk is brought to you in part by Growmark FS. Keeping up on the latest in ag is a challenge to say the least, but there are experts nearby ready to help. You'll find them at your local FS. You can trust them to bring you customized agronomic grain and energy solutions born of the latest thinking. That's because FS specialists receive continuous training that keeps them current on the latest trends, practices, and technologies. So you'll get local expertise that's both exceptional and up to date. Visit FSSystem.com to learn how FS is bringing you what's next. And good afternoon. Welcome into Market Talk for this Thursday, July 29th. I'm your host, Jesse Allen. Thanks for joining us here. Appreciate you being uh, part of the family and uh, making us part of your day here today. MarketTalkAg.com. That's our home on the web. MarketTalkAg.com is where you can find us. Find all our social media links, all of our streaming sources, our great radio affiliates, and much more. It's all online, markettalkag.com. A strong day in the grains today as we near the end of the week and the end of the month. Let's bring in our good friend John Heinberg with Total Farm Marketing joining us here this afternoon. John, uh, looking over this market here today at the close, solid day. We were talking about a few different things before we jumped on the air, but I think overall um, just a a solid day uh, with some of these uh, news stories and some of these uh, backbones of the market trade right now. Uh, just giving us some bullish momentum to trade a little higher with wheat leading today. Yeah, a good day today. You know, we started strong. We held on to it for once. Uh, you know, obviously we did have a little rain on the radar in, in Wisconsin and Illinois. And it kind of just seemed to ignore that overall today, too. And, you know, we're really kind of focused on maybe what's happening on the demand side of the coin. You know, export sales numbers came out today. Corn was disappointing, but we saw another really good week of shipments. So that maybe that was a something that helped out in terms of supporting some price today. You know, and we got soybeans side of the equation. We've got an export sale announcement this morning. We haven't had one of those in a while. So maybe we're kind of getting into that window where U.S. beans are getting a little bit more competitive and South American supplies are getting a little tighter. You know, we expect that maybe to ramp up as we go forward. And obviously the wheat market's got the, what's going on with that spring wheat tour underneath of it. And uh, in terms of the yields that they're seeing or not seeing in that regard, as well as just some other global issues that at least just are giving wheat a bit of a bid right now. And that's really helping out the market especially that corn market well uh, on the wheat side we can stay there on that on that train a little bit because that's the leader today as i mentioned and you alluded to it some other issues i know black sea wheat prices are rising sharply they got some heat issues over there and then of course that spring wheat crop it's it's we knew that this spring wheat crop was in trouble and essentially the wheat quality council tour this week confirming that Spring wheat is, is pretty much non-existent up in North Dakota here, at least. And we know that translates to uh, many of the areas across the Northern Plains and into the Canadian prairies, John. Very much so. And, you know, when you got to look at the whole grain picture in general, what's going on here in terms of what's being wanted on the demand side of the equation. You know, in the last handful of weeks between the United States as well as other areas of the world, the Canadian prairies, you know, we saw a pretty decent size reduction in terms of what's out there for available supply of food grains. And that's and wheat probably being one of the leaders there is uh, definitely showing up in terms of what's happening on the market side. You know, export sales, 500,000 ton this week for U.S. wheat. That's a solid number at this time frame. You know, so it's good to see that we're getting some of the export business on top of the fact that maybe the supply side globally isn't as, as full as we thought it was just a handful of months ago. You know, so we can really be a leader here, especially if we continue to see some decent demand come in. And then we got to think about the one little thing in the outside markets after the Fed's uh, meeting yesterday and the comments uh, by Chairman Powell about basically not seeing any slowing of the, you know, the funding or the monetary policy. And we got the U.S. dollar breaking to its lowest level in about a month today. So that added a little bit more into the gray markets, I think, today overall. Well, looking at the corn market, uh, John, I know you alluded to this uh, with wheat. And this corn market's kind of been range-bound. And a lot of traders are trying to balance out the, the bad of the Western Ang Belt with the good of the Eastern Ang Belt and watching the forecasts. And really just seems like we can't seem to pick a direction here lately. Uh, what are your thoughts on this corn market right now, where it stands and and where we could be heading here as we move into the month of August? You know, I'm kind of cautious here. There's a couple things that are kind of on, on my radar that make me a little nervous, at least from the standpoint of what producers should be thinking about at this time frame. Obviously, we got the August report coming up very soon. That's going to be done by producer survey. Does the USDA have enough information with crop ratings, even though they're you know, very subjective? 
you know, where they are, you know, the demand where it is right now, which has been on the disappointing side in the corn market. You know, like I said, we're seeing some life and maybe beans and wheat, but corn, you know, 115 million, uh, 115,000 tons on reductions today. Not exactly what we want to see to keep a market strong. You know, we just can't seem to get through this 550, 555 area. We've been kind of pinging around here for a couple of weeks now as we're winding the spring. And we're going to break one way or another. So we're just curious to see which way that's going to be. So to me, I'm a little cautious here. Seasonality says we work ourselves lower. If that USDA number in, in August doesn't come back with a yield reduction, I wouldn't be surprised to see the funds who are still holding a a large, a long position in corn, you know, liquidate this thing to a fall low. Uh, so it's gonna, really going to come down to we need to see something trigger this market. That's either going to be on the demand side of the equation or we need to see what's kind of an estimated supply side start getting tighter. Uh, until that happens, I think we're on the defensive. And realistically, as quiet as we've been the last couple of weeks, some of the volatility has just disappeared in this market. And you can put some really good defense together. I was looking today, 520 puts for December, around 20 cents. You can put a $5 board floor to harvest on with this right now for a pretty minimal cost. Even the $5 put around 13 cents. You know, to me, that just is good strategy given where we could be if all of a sudden the supply side gets bigger or the demand doesn't come through. That's great advice. I And I would agree with you there. That just seems like a no-brainer to me who moving into harvest just with all the unknowns still out there on, on the weather side, the demand side, everything that's kind of playing together. That just seems like a no brainer to me and a, and a good uh, strategy idea there. Of course, it all comes down to our bottom line, our specific operations. You mentioned soybeans. It seems like there's more life in that market. I've been encouraged. We've been holding that front month above this $14 level for a couple days. Now you look as well at the uh, September bean contract, Closing in on $14, November, not far behind. So it seems like this soy complex really has some good life to it. Uh, what are your thoughts, though, on beans as we head into August? You know, I'm still friendly there. Again, obviously, beans are made in August, and that's going to be the focus of the market as the weather going into the next handful of weeks here as we start getting through, you know, pod fill stage and, and, and you know, that maturity level that we need to see for beans. You know, first off, the actions of August, obviously we do have first notice date tomorrow for August beans. So that's bringing a little extra volatility into that front end of the market. But, you know, it might be just flat out reflecting the fact that we just don't have any beans. Uh, the supply side is tight. You know, the basis levels are still strong uh, overall. So that's going to keep a little bit of bid in the front end of the market. I'd be way, kind of cautious and watching what happens with that early bean harvest, especially down in the south and the Gulf regions and getting some fresh supplies in. And maybe that starts weighing a little bit here if that starts happening. But overall, again, we're looking at a market right now that understands it's got a historically tight supply going well into next year. We've got some questions, obviously, on the weather side. You know, we've mentioned it before, 22% of the acreage or so is up in the North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota region, which saw ratings slide again last week. I expect those ratings probably to slide again this week. So that's going to keep this market going, you know, very supported because realistically, if we lose a bushel, bushel and a half off that average yield that we're targeting right now. That pretty much takes, takes out our carryout for next year. So now if the demand picks in, that's just even going to make things a little bit more interesting. And except me, we got a little bit of glimmer the last few days here with, you know, being sailed to Mexico last week, one to unknown destinations here today, that maybe that window is starting to show up where U.S. beans are going to be competitive again. Very, very true. And, you know, I think one of the other stories we're not hearing a whole lot about, I'm starting to hear it from some of these private crop tours, is some of the disease pressure in beans in the eastern corn belt. And I think that's something that, we have to take into account as well, not only the drought stricken uh, crops in the northwestern belt, but you know disease pressure in the east that could also bring us a, an impact to this bean crop. It could uh, possibly be another reason why we see it shrink. And then I think obviously we're looking to South America as well and, and their crops and that harvest down there with soybeans. Um, there's a lot of things here that I think I would agree with you. I think it could tighten up our carry out here. It's just going to be a matter of getting through the next couple of weeks here in the U.S. to see exactly what happens, John. Exactly. But we still got to watch what happens in August. If the weather does moderate, typically that is the seasonal window where beans have their weakest month of the summer is in August in terms of price. So we could just see that seasonality kick in. 
you know, even maybe it's not merited or not. But again, when you got the markets that we trade nowadays without pits out there with just computers and, and things of that nature, the logarithm traders, the momentum traders, if we get some type of news that makes this market want to start sliding, we could easily see that seasonal push to a low. But to me, then that's just going to turn to a buying opportunity. You know, one thing you watch what happens in some of the industry side of it, ADM had their conference earnings call this week. And they were talking about what's going to happen with the soybean side of the equation. And they're basically saying, hey, there's an issue with this canola crop in Canada. They think there's going to be a hole for soybean meal in China, that they could pick up a couple extra million tons of, of soybeans. And they, they were projecting that the fourth quarter will be a very aggressive export marketing program, just like we saw last year. So again, if you are making some sales in here, make sure you got those calls in place well into 2022 to make sure you got some upside available. I want to talk outside markets and equities uh, before we go to livestock, John. The stock market's been making new record highs, and we're seeing some uh, some different factors there that are playing into our commodities. What are your thoughts on uh, where this outside market uh, activity stands right now as we uh, move out of July into August? Yeah, you couldn't ask for a better situation realistically after the Fed meeting here just yesterday when you know the Fed said they're going to hold off on bringing you know tapering any of the funds. Again, the stock market likes the free money that's coming at them. We're pushing through 35000 again today, trying to poke at or maybe put in some new highs on the cash side. That caused that U.S. dollar to break. That just brings a risk on mentality. You know, and realistically, what's the market that's been the quietest of the bunch lately? That's been the grains with the exception of the volatility in the wheat market. So that could set us up for it's just a stage of technical buying if we continue to see some strength that encourages money flow overall. Uh, to come in and look at some of the risk assets. So, you know, if the dollar continues this trend, it's a pretty big break here today, kind of rolling over after a nice little rally against commodities. We'll have to see how that plays out. Obviously, energy markets strong today. See what's happening on the global demand side. We get those crude oil prices moving again. That's just going to lift things up in general as well. Let's talk livestock, hogs, African swine fever confirmed in the Dominican Republic. And I know a lot of folks are talking about that and a lot of worries surrounding that. Our hog market today was strong through mid-morning and then we kind of tapered off. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on all the news chatter out there and how that's uh, parlaying its way into our markets right now? You know, obviously that's a scary situation to me. That's getting a little close to home when you're starting to talk and, you know, still finally getting it on the Western side of the, of the, you know, the world here. We'll have to really watch that. You know, maybe it's just a matter of time before something happens in the United States. I hope I'm, you know, not being prophetic with that statement uh, just because obviously we don't want to have to deal with what, you know, could be the outcome. You know, obviously, if we see a massive reduction in the pig herd in the United States, that's going to have uh, carryover effects into the grain side of the equation as well. You know, so right now, obviously, we're not in a panic mode. The market really kind of shook off the news, you know, isolated incident mentality. We don't bring any pork products in from the Dominican Republic at this time frame. But, you know, again, it is still getting closer. So, you know, we'll see how that plays out. Right now, though, hog markets had a pretty good run, put a bit of a toppy signal in here a couple days ago, followed through with a limit down move yesterday. You know, even despite the strength that we're seeing in, in the retail product side here that, you know, maybe we were just uh, kind of getting to the point we could roll this market over for a little bit of profit taking. I know I was recommending buying puts here on Monday after the way the market just traded. I think we just stay a fairly choppy here. We got a pretty big premium of the cash market to the futures right now. So that's going to at least give us some support, you know, in the nearby you know, we just got to see what happens with the demand side. You know, today we had a solid number of export sales, but as you go through the report, China was missing again. And uh, in terms of one of the major buyers, so that's still going to be something that this market's going to be watching. We don't know what's going on over there in terms of their their hog herd in general. Again, yesterday they were just talking about how they want to stabilize pig pork prices and things of that nature in terms of some policy, and that's just going to have ripple effects over here in the United States. On the cattle front, uh, since we last talked, we had a very friendly cattle on feed report, cattle inventory report last Friday, and we've seen uh, some decent strength here this week. I know feedlot country, they're holding out for higher cash, um, but then today we kind of come back in here after the export sales and we turn this market lower, feeders uh, no doubt probably influenced by the higher inputs today. Um, but overall, what are your thoughts on this cattle market here as we near the end of the week? You know, we had a nice move off that cattle and feed number and the cattle inventory numbers obviously confirming what we knew. Cow numbers and as well as cattle numbers in general are getting smaller. You know, the demand continues to be fairly strong. 
But the problem continues to be the, the influence of the cash market in terms of the futures market. The Packers just are not motivated to bid up because the slaughter capacity is holding around that 120,000 head a day. You know, and they've basically taken this pile of cattle here in the front end and they've smoothed it out. And it's going to work itself probably now well into the end of August, which keeps the cash market lackluster and disappointing and preventing any major rallies from kicking out. You know, right now we're probably being supported by the fact that retail values have popped here over the last few days. That's maybe because the retailers are starting to get the buying in now for the Labor Day holiday. You know, I'm going to be a little cautious, though, when that passes and we see these carcass values starting to soften again. If they do, that's going to bring prices down. So, you know, we got a window here, and at least in the front end, I'm a little more cautious. Don't like the price action, especially with the close today. It feels like we got some more room for the market to fall here just because of the disappointing cash trade again this week. You know, feeders too, strong, really good value out there. But if the grain markets wake up, they're going to be posed for some profit taking. So, you know, it might be a window in here. You can put some pretty good floor underneath for not a lot of cost, especially if you got some October cattle around 128. That's a pretty good floor to put in here, you know, for wrong. And you got the upside still open. I know looking at feedlot country, a lot of sales today, 120 live. Uh, we did get a little bit of 123. Uh, some dress sales at 196, 196.50 here today. So really not, uh, not really moving that cash market like uh, like what the feedlots wanted to here, John. As you kind of alluded to, just kind of staying stagnant there. Yeah, and you know we're still hearing trade coming in, and now they're talking end of August cattle that they're starting to cure. You know, we just got a lot of cattle in the south, and that's just what's weighing on this market. And again, if there's cattle out there, the Packers are not motivated to bid up aggressively because there's just no competition. You know, now let's flip it to the long term picture. Let's talk about those cattle inventory numbers very quickly. You know, again, we saw cow herd ninety eight percent of last year, calf crop down a percentage point. You know, we've seen the placement numbers being a little bit tighter on the cattle and feed report. We're already poking at 140 in April for next year. And then we're going to probably bring some more competition in on the capacity side for slaughter. So, you know, to me, I love what the long term gives us. If we get any pullback out there in the thir into the 2022 contracts, I want to be an owner of some calls or you're definitely setting some puts in play to really protect a good floor and then leave that top side open for your cattle because I think the opportunities are going to be there given the tighter numbers. John, any thoughts on the dairy market here for us today? You know, dairy market just continues to struggle with the supply situation. You know, thought maybe had a little bit of a bounce and now we've dropped that right back into new lows again. But it's just a lot of pressure there. You, and also you just read some of the commentary out there. They're the product that's probably struggling the most in terms of some of the issues in terms and logistics and transport and moving product around. It's just causing some backup of supplies. You know, right now we need the dairy producers to see some more cows move to the sidelines and they're not doing that. So that's keeping production heavy. And now if feed costs do come down or call down, you know, that's only going to make things a little bit easier for the producer to, you know, budget some more animals in. So we need to start seeing cows move to the sidelines there. We need to see that production come down as we're getting into the summer months now. We're curious what the next production report looks like. But at this stage, I'm very defensive on that milk market, especially you're looking at the end of the year, 1740, 1750. It feels like we got some room for both those contracts to finish out the year to come lower. John, final thoughts here on this Thursday. Anything else you want to mention or reiterate for us today? You know, one of the biggest things going on right now in the grains, we just don't have a lot of players in the market. And that's some of the reason we just kind of run out of gas on rallies. They just need more people, something to fire up to get that interest back in. That may come after the USDA report here in the early part of August. We'll see what those numbers give us. You know, but right now it's gotten to be kind of the dog days of summer. And we're seeing that as the volatility has fallen apart. And in a market that wants money flowing in and out, low volatility that doesn't help that. And it just makes it easier without news for prices to probably gravitate softer. Well, John, maybe during this uh, time where the volatility is a little bit less, be a good time for producers to take a look at their marketing plan. If they need some advice, I know they can reach out to you and the team there at Total Farm Marketing to get a little help, can't they? Sure, I'd love to chat with them anytime. Like I said before, with low volatility, that means there's some opportunities to put some really good positions in place to get you through the end of the year. Give me a call, 800-334-9779, or shoot me an email at johnh at totalfarmmarketing.com. Don't forget about that website. Again, a lot of great information, webinars that are archived that you can take a look at at totalfarmmarketing.com.
John, appreciate the time as always. Thank you, sir. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you next week. Sounds great. Have a good week, everybody. John Heinberg with Total Farm Marketing, our guest today here on Market Talk, brought to you by Grow Mark FS. Find us online, markettalkag.com. This has been the Thursday, July 29th edition of Market Talk. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.